Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to our channel, and thanks for logging on. If you enjoy these videos, do me a favor and subscribe to our YouTube channel right here at Watchbox Reviews. I would really appreciate it, and I promise to update daily. If you like this watch, you can purchase it on our website, thewatchbox.com. Today we're discussing an all-timer. I'm frankly a little bit embarrassed to admit I've never featured this timepiece in its original form on Watchbox Reviews. Often discussed on the internet, but rarely shared in its original mid-90s form. This is the Bond Seamaster. This is the Omega Seamaster Professional Diver 300 meter and its original pre-coaxial execution, no less. This is a watch that I own. It was my first luxury watch. It was my graduation watch after high school. So for that reason, this is going to be a bit of a sentimental overview. I'll try to stay objective. Objectively, this watch is thin, 11.8 millimeters thick. The current versions are over 13 millimeters millimeters thick. So the pre-coaxial, when it was a 2892 Omega Caliber 1120, were far more of a hybrid of a dress watch and a dive watch in profile because this watch can slip underneath any cuff. In terms of case size, it's 41.5 millimeters. That's not including the crown, crown guard, or helium escape valve. Across the wrist, it has a compact 48 millimeter lug to lug dimension, but when you add the solid end links, it does extend its footprint to 52.2. I would say that you could wear it on a wrist as small as 13 and a half centimeters circumference on a strap. On the bracelet, as shown, 14 centimeters circumference. It is very comfortable. The bracelet was half of the appeal of this model. A five-link design with a little bit of a rounded tumble home to the side of the shoulder links, it really did look like a blend of a dress watch and a dive watch bracelet. Far less brutal than the three-link Rolex Oyster, it has a combination of polished and satin finished links, and because the links are individually small, it is very silky on the wrist. You also note that there are large channels between the links to avoid pinching skin, pulling hair, or trapping heat. Now you will note that this being one of the original models, pins and sleeves were used for sizing. When this watch was new, Back in the mid-90s, it had a retail price of around $2,000, and that was considered acceptable at the price because you got the best clasp in the business. That's a compromise I'll take nine times out of ten. The only time I need to size a bracelet is when I first get the watch. How often will I use the clasp? Every single darn time I put it on. Twin trigger deployment. This was not a stamped clasp, but machined from the solid, and it put Rolex's stamped oyster clasps from this period to shame. No clamshell like the Rolex. Twin trigger release. No stamped body. Fully machined from an ingot. You'll also note the best extension of the 90s. A full extension, an all or nothing fold out. It's machined from solid components like the clasp, and it is very steady when closed. It's also very secure when opened. It doesn't feel like the stamped spindly tin foil that Rolex gave you on their clasps during this era. This one feels like it's going to hang on for dear life. You can use it over a wetsuit, you can use it over a dive suit, but I only ever used it over thick sweaters and winter coats. I went to school in New Hampshire, and remember, this was my graduation watch. So rolling back over to the case flank, you can see it's mostly familiar. Satin finished sheer sides, longitudinal satin finish. Let's get close here and give ourselves a bit more light. But it's longitudinal satin finish, and you'll note that the bevels themselves, as on a Speedmaster, are of high polish, so it does break up the mass of the metal, even though, once again, this is more of an elegant form than most dive watches. It's not all that massive. Nevertheless, handsome, colorful, nicely differentiated by differential finish. It also has a wonderful bezel, as the bezel structure is, though perhaps a bit slippery, blessed with a wonderfully gratifying detent. So there are easier dive bezels to manipulate with wet, sweaty, or gloved hands, but once you've got it going, it feels and sounds like a million dollars. The anodized aluminum insert, there is plenty to recommend it. I once crashed my version of this watch on a bicycle at 20 miles an hour, and I took a chunk out of the anodized insert of the bezel. I didn't get the sapphire. I scratched it a little bit, but I hit the bezel hard. No fracture, no chipping, no shattering. That's the advantage of an old school anodized aluminum bezel. And it's why you still don't see many ceramic bezels on truly hardcore sports watch brands like Seiko and Zinn. 
You will note also that there's a luminescent pearl on that bezel, and I used to use this during my college days as a timer to figure out how much time had elapsed from the start of a test and how much time I had left. A dive bezel is the world's best chronograph, easy to read at a glance, and how often do you use a chronograph for more than 60 minutes anyway? The dial of this watch is as classic as its profile. It's the famed matte blue omega wave. It's a sort of combination of charcoal and navy blue. That's the best way to describe the tone. It's wonderfully subtle, and you can see even on the camera that it only shows itself from certain angles, so it's not obtrusive in any way. It is beautiful, and it does have a little bit of a glossy luster when you turn it at the right angle, but for the most part, quite subtle, discreet, well chosen by Omega's designers. The original version of this dial featured Luminova and printed indices, and you can see them here. There will be a loom shot at the end of this video, so stay tuned. You'll also note that the original dial, before the 1998 debut of the GMT in its broadsword style hands, featured these gorgeous skeletonized broadsword hands. They're easy to view at night. They're not quite as bright as the broadsword, but they're considered to be a styling classic and a crucial element of what's known as the Bond Seamaster, this reference 253180. Those skeleton hands are a big part of the look. Now the movement is modified 4 Omega by ETA. The ETA 2892A2 in chronometer grade 21 joules in automatic becomes the 23 joule Omega 1120. It gains an extra two hours of power reserve to go from 42 to 44, and it gains an extra two joules to further refine the winding system, so it goes from 21 to 23. Thin, fine, tough, bi-directional winding, 44 hour power reserve, 4 hertz beat rate or 28,800 vibrations per hour. COSC certified Swiss chronometer adjusted in five positions. It features hacking or stop seconds, as well as a quick set function for the dates. So you can rapidly cycle it should it run down. 300 meter water resistance, screw down crown, and a helium escape valve, which James Bond himself famously used as a grenade in GoldenEye. Your experience may vary. I find that it's a great conversation piece, regardless of whether you're a James Bond or a saturation diver. If neither, it's fun to get more than you need, and it becomes a great conversation starter with your Submariner fans, who will have to explain why they didn't get one and have to pony up for a sea dweller to get that particular feature. Handsome, tough, timeless, and versatile. I can't overemphasize that with this bracelet and this slim case profile, the original so-called Bond Seamaster 300 diver now looks like a handsome dress watch with the rugged features and functionality of a diver. See this classic and make it yours on the watch box. And I'm back with the SMP 300 diver. As you can see, even with the original skeleton hands, this is an easy watch to read. Robustly loomed, including the bezel. You can see this one by the light of day on the watch box.